In this video, we're going to talk about the different organizational forms in business, as well as the features of one of those forms, which is um, corporations, how corporations are, are legally kind of created, what's the relationship that they have with their owners, um, and so on and so forth. This is a very introductory lesson within the corporate issuer section of the curriculum. You'll find hopefully a lot of these things that I'm going to talk about here quite basic. You probably know them already, hopefully with a few exceptions, especially in relation to partnerships. If you come from a country or a jurisdiction where partnerships are not necessarily a very common thing, uh, then you need to pay attention especially to that um, section. Okay, now when we discuss organizational forms, so the way in which business can be carried out, um, we may analyze them across various dimensions. And what I'll do here on my board is basically recreate a table that you'll find in your uh, curriculum text, a very important one, because it, it uh, summarizes everything, almost everything that you need to know. So the dimensions across which I want to analyze different organizational forms are going to be as follows. We'll start off, and don't be surprised that I'm starting off sort of kind of in the middle of my on my board because I want to leave some space up here for, for, for drawings. I'm going to start with the legal um, identity of the, uh, of the business. So legal identity. And what I mean by this is, does the business have a separate legal identity, separate from its owners? Is it a separate entity in the light of law? Can the business enter into contracts? Can the business hire people? Can the business be sued by somebody? Or can the business sue someone? As opposed to the owners being the uh, parties to contracts and so on. Now, the next point is going to be the owner and manager stroke operator relationship. What's the, what's the nature of the relationship between the owners of the business and those who, who manage it? Because often the uh, managers will not be the ones who are actually uh, the owners, especially in the case of corporations. Now, the next point I want to have on the agenda is owner liability. What is the extent to which owners are responsible for various things that may go wrong in the business? the risks and debts and losses, etc. Okay. Um, a very important criterion relates to taxation. Who pays taxes? At what level are taxes levied and charged? And finally, access to capital. How easy is it for the business to get access to extra funding. And you'll see that this varies across the different organizational forms. Okay, so let's explore the different um, organization, organizational forms. I'm going to start off with this sort of the most basic one, uh, which is called a sole trader, which means an individual in business. Now, instead of saying sole trader, you may also say sole proprietorship pro uh pro how do you spell this proprietorship sorry uh english is not my native language so sometimes I get the spelling completely wrong proprietorship okay an individual doing conducting business is really the most basic organizational form um that you that you know business may take in this case the business and owner are not separate. The owner is the business and the business is, an, is the owner. Or we sometimes say that the business, I think your curriculum states this as well, the business is an extension of the owner. So the business doesn't have any separate legal identity. Um, so when it's a contradiction like here, I'm going to use maybe the color red, no separate. Oh, I should be writing this here. Okay, no separate legal identity sorry identity got this in the wrong place no separate legal identity good we'll see this happen quite a lot here 
what is the owner, manager, stroke, operator of the business relationship? Well, this one is quite obvious because if it's a sole trader, it's uh, owner operated. So the owner is the person doing the work in the business. What about owner liability? Well, this, this is a legal thing, but it's, it's extremely important because the business is not a separate legal entity, a separate legal person. Uh, it's an extension of the owner. Anything that goes wrong goes on the owner's account. And the owner is, from a legal perspective, fully liable and responsible for everything that happens, for all the debts, for all the damages that such a business may do to others and inflict on others. So I'm going to say here, sole, meaning 100% complete, unlimited um, liability, or rather sole, meaning maybe not 100%, 100% is indicated by unlimited, but sole, meaning not shared with anybody else because we're we're alone in this type of venture. Now, from a taxation point of view, I'm going to introduce a very important concept, namely pass through. And you'll see this quite a lot appearing elsewhere here as well as we go along. So this is an H at the end, sorry, pass through. We don't pay any corporate income taxes. We don't have a company that would pay taxes itself. So whatever earnings, whatever income the business generates are taxed at the level of the owner. So the owner pays personal income tax based on the earnings generated by their business activity. So everything is taxed at the personal meaning owner level. Okay, and as you imagine, you may imagine, when it comes to the access to capital, well, that's a little bit limited, isn't it? Or actually, we don't know. It's limited to the um, access enjoyed by the owner. If the owner has plenty of access to money, no problem. But as with many sole proprietorships, um, that may not be the case. So access to capital is limited to... Um, or limited to or by, let's say, the owner's access. Okay, good. Um, that's the most basic form. I wouldn't really expect you to get questions on this. It's a little bit um, simple, although you never know. Maybe in a sort of in a question which gets you to contrast this against something else, uh, possibly, but not a standalone question, I, I wouldn't think. Now, the next two types of uh, organization forms that we're going to discuss here relate to partnerships, or in fact, two different types of partnerships, a general partnership and a limited um, partnership. In fact, your curriculum talks about three different partnerships, but then explores only two of them, realistically in in more detail so we're, i'm going to start with um the first one the general partnership uh, let's use a different color general partnership okay the first thing to say is that a General partnership is very similar in terms of the features to a sole proprietorship or a sole trader, with the exception that there is more people involved. But uh, those people, um, to, to, to a large extent, uh, you know, they can bring more resources because there's more of them. But other than that, things are very similar. So the, the, the general partnership is, uh, this one is formed by GPs, uh, general partners. Don't confuse this with GP, general practitioner, which relates to a doctor in many, in many uh, countries. Um, GP, general partners. And these general partners are like sole traders in the sense that um, there is no separate legal identity for the business. Separate legal identity, the partnership is not a legal entity in its own right. 
And uh, when it comes to this owner-manager relationship, well, in, in a general partnership, everything is going to be run by the partners. So it's partner-operated. The partners get together and they contact business together. Now, over here we wrote sole unlimited liability. Here I'm going to say um, shared unlimited liability. So still, um, the partners, the owners are going to be faced with unlimited liability for all the debts and you know losses of the business and so on and so forth. So if anything goes wrong, uh, they may lose their personal assets, um, possibly. And actually, the thing is, I said shared over here, but typically in this, the majority of jurisdictions where you find such general partnerships, what's going to happen is even though we're supposed to share in the profits, but also the risks and therefore the losses and debts and so on, if one of the partners is unable to cover their share of those losses, let's say, the other partners uh, still face unlimited liability. So if money cannot be recovered from one of them, the others are on the hook for that missing amount. Okay, same story applies over here to the taxation aspect. So pass through and you know what that means. The partners pay tax on um, the income of their business at personal level as individuals. And just like before, I guess you could say that access to capital is limited by this time, not the owners, but the partners um, access. So how good they are at accessing capital and what resources they can get their hands on. It's difficult to... Um, say up front and determine up front what that access could be. Now, the second type of partnership, which is going to be a bit more interesting from an organizational point of view, is what we call a limited partnership or LP. Uh, actually, LP is going to be uh, the name of one of the partners or the abbreviation we give to one of the partners. And watch out, there's a third one called Limited Liability Partnership, an LLP. That's a third form which your curriculum discusses, and we'll, we'll jot some notes on that as well. So what happens in a limited partnership? You're going to have over here at least one GP which as before stands for general partner. And the GP is going to have or face unlimited liability for everything that may go wrong in the business, losses, debts, etc. And this one GP or at least one GP who faces unlimited liability may, however, may, doesn't have to, um, may have managerial responsibilities. So they may actually run the thing. Responsibilities. Okay. At the same time, you're going to have typically, on top of that one GP, or at least one GP, you're also going to have uh, many limited partners who are referred to as LPs, okay? And these limited partners will have, as the name suggests, they've got limited liability. How much they can lose is limited to the amount of money they invest, they put in. They cannot lose more. But at the same time, on the flip side, let's say, they cannot be involved in managing the business, but 
cannot have uh, any sort of managerial involvement. They are the providers of capital, but they cannot run the thing, they cannot run the show, so to speak. So these are the features of a limited partnership. And if we were to condense this into these, uh, let's say, uh, dimensions or analyze things across dimensions, starting with legal identity, well, once again, it's a partnership. Partnerships don't have a separate legal identity. So they are, once again, an extension of the partners, just like here. And here it was an extension of the sole owner. Um, previously, I said partner operated for a general partnership, but this time I'm going to say GP operated because uh, the GP is the single partner who can actually run things. Although I did say they may have managerial responsibility they sometimes outsource this managerial responsibility to a third party. This is especially true for funds who outsource this managerial responsibility to a um, sort of external uh, fund, uh, fund manager who has a license and so on. Now, when it comes to owner liability, we're going to have a, a split because it depends on who you are. The GP uh, has unlimited liability. Though in reality, especially in the world of funds, there are ways to kind of circumvent that. Uh, but it's not relevant for the CFA exam, at least not this level of the CFA exam. Um, however, the LPs, the limited partners, face limited liability, limited to the amounts which they invest. Now, taxation is once again going to be a pass through affair, meaning the partners pay tax at their individual personal level. And uh, what can we say about access to capital? As before, it's going to be limited or in some way bounded by the partners' uh, partners access the wealth and ability of the partners to, to get their hands on some much needed potentially capital. Now, I've got space, quite a lot of space over here still, but I want to tell you about um, one more partnership. I'm not necessarily going to analyze it in a um, in this table. Maybe I'll, I'll just use the space that I've got up here to, um, to talk about it. So this is going to be an LLP. It's, a, it's the third type of partnership that you need to know. So this was the first one, the general partnership. This was the second. This is going to be the third, and it stands for limited liability partnership. Now, please, whatever you already know about LPs, if you know about partnerships, you know, kind of don't take that to be indicative of what you should use on the exam as knowledge, because you have to go with what the curriculum tells you, which is very sort of jurisdiction specific. And in different jurisdictions, these things work sometimes very differently. So in the world of the level one curriculum, you need to understand the difference between limited, general, and limited liability partnership. Now, this one is going to be a bit similar to this, but not really. Um, there's going to be important um, tweaks. It has no GP, so no general partner, nobody who would take unlimited responsibility or liability. That's not needed. It has LPs only, limited partners only. OK, uh, so only those who have limited liability for what the partnership does. It's these guys, these LPs, who will be involved in the management of the partnership. So this time, the LP 
has no restrictions or LPs don't have restrictions about how involved they can be in the day-to-day -day management of the business. Here, it, it's absolutely kind of expected that they would be um, would be uh, sharing the managerial duties. LPs only, and they get involved in managing the business, the partnership. And what typically happens is um, they will be um, they will be um, typically selecting one of the partners, one of the LPs, to act as the managing partner uh, to kind of lead the partnership. And um, if, you, if you hear the word management, managing partner, you may be thinking of professional services firms, for example, US-based ones. That this is a very common setup, the LLP for in the US and other countries as well, to have professional services uh, companies like accountancy firms, law firms, architecture firms, engineering firms, uh, run by a managing partners, but surrounded by many other um, partners as well. And uh, actually, in the US, what your curriculum talks about is that the um, possibilities to use that LLP structure are limited to certain professions or certain sort of industries only, uh, professional services mainly, uh, firms, uh, but not everything else. Okay, so know the difference, appreciate the difference um, to limited partnership. The difference is no GP. LPs only, and LPs have limited liability uh, because they are limited partners, but they can be involved in the management of the of the company, which is a which is a considerable change to what we saw before. And I've still got lots of space over here on the right hand side, which is great because I'll need it to discuss the most uh, complicated of all the forms. And that's uh, a corporation, okay, over here. So I'm going to write corporation. But I'm also going to need a bit of space up here to draw stuff related to corporations. So uh, bear with me for a moment. I'm going to clean my board and come back to you in a second. So generally, I, I wrote down corporation here, but we're going to talk about limited companies in the sense of um, entities that have a separate legal identity. They're no longer going to be um, an extension of the owner. They're going to be companies that can uh, you know, sign agreements, sign contracts, hire people, be sued, get sued, everything I wrote about uh, before, issue debt and, and so on. And uh, limited companies actually come in to varieties at least you know this is the the context on which your curriculum is written um which is again i guess going to be very much inspired by an american concept uh, context but not just american also a lot of european examples are thrown in we're going to have private limited companies Okay, as well as public limited companies. And it's this second type that's also going to be referred to as corporations, at least in your, sorry, corporations in your curriculum. So that's where we get the corporation idea over here, right, from, from, this, from this notion. Now, um, I'll tell you the difference between um, the two in just a moment. It's quite technical, what you'll see. Um, and hopefully you'll also be able to relate this to kind of your knowledge of uh, business life. So let me draw a bit of a an extension over here, a bit of a separator, because I just want to draw some things. It's not going to be a separate organizational form. It's just some ideas. You see, in a in a in a limited company. You're going to have owners uh, who are typically referred to as shareholders. And um, these owners will typically elect what we call a board of directors. Now, I know boards of directors don't exist in every country. 
Uh, but in the context of what you need to know for the CFA exam, this is the way to go. A board of directors, on the other hand, uh, appoints um, executive managers, executives, well, executive directors, um, executives, um, e.g. the chief executive officer, the CEO, the CFO, and so on. And it's obviously these people who will be responsible for the day-to-day -day running of, of the company. So in the case of uh, limited companies, you're, you're going to typically have a separation of uh, owner and operator. It's going to be the executive who run the show, but it's uh, the shareholders who are the owners of the company. And the shareholders' interests are supposed to be represented by these people, right? The board of directors and executives should look after uh, and should act in the best interest of the owners. <sighs> which doesn't always happen, but owners, shareholders have voting rights and they can, um, using the formalized process that takes place, for example, at the annual general meeting of shareholders, they can vote or they can elect different members to the board, different directors to the board, or they can influence the decisions of the board in various ways. Um, right. Because the owners are not generally involved in the day-to-day -day running of the business. There's that separation of ownership and management. This allows companies to access a much deeper pool of funding because whoever provides capital into the, the business doesn't have to automatically be involved in running it, right? So this is going to definitely open up space over here when it comes to access to capital. But I want to go up here to the top and I want to talk about the uh, difference between public limited companies and uh, private limited companies. Well, the difference as stated in your curriculum is such that typically in a private limited company, you're going to have restrictions, and these are sort of legally imposed, on the number of owners, the number of shareholders. So in terms of the number not growing beyond a certain level. But also, on top of that, there may be restrictions on the transfer of ownership. So if one of the owners wants to sell their stake, they can't necessarily do it just like that. They typically need to or often need to get the consent of the other owners, etc. It's not like it's, it's impossible to sell, but you typically have to get some kind of okay from the other owners, which makes it a little bit restrictive, at least to some extent. But at the same time, so these restrictions already noted Private limited companies, your curriculum states, in many jurisdictions enjoy that pass-through concept or the, the benefit of that concept, meaning tax is paid not at the corporate company level, but at the level of the owners. Now, in the case of public limited companies, and I do want to emphasize that this is how your curriculum portrays it, which may not be the way it works in your country. It's definitely not the way it works in my country, where I come from. But in the case of public limited companies, there will be no restrictions on the number of owners, no restrictions on the transfer of ownership. So um, no restrictions over here. But, and this is the big one, there will be no pass-through. The corporation, the, co the company, will have to pay corporation tax or company tax, corporate income tax. And then the owners will have to pay tax again when they receive a dividend, which is a distribution out of the profits made by a business, which gets, so corporate income tax at corporation level, 
and then again uh, when dividends are paid and received by the shareholders, by the owners, well, these are going to be subject uh, to uh, personal income tax, which gets us into a very important concept referred to as double taxation. And your curriculum talks about it quite a lot. Now, this is obviously a drawback of having a corporation. But at the same time, um, the fact that there are no restrictions on the number of owners and no restrictions on those owners selling their stakes, the shares, means this is a very suitable form for those companies who want to list on a stock exchange and give their owners, the shareholders, the co-owners of the business, the possibility to trade, buy in, sell their shares without any um, limitations. The downside is the double taxation, but for those companies that plan to not necessarily pay a lot of dividends, but retain a lot of their profits in-house and reinvest those uh, profits uh, within the business, this will be a very suitable form. Now, from the point of view of summing things up in our table, I'm just going to go with this uh, corporation concept because your curriculum doesn't really examine the private limited company um, and, it, and in any way beyond these drawbacks and benefits. I mean, this is still applicable to any company. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's private limited or public limited. So this ownership, board of director and executive, um, so management structure, but here, let's summarize some of the features of the corporation being the, the one that we really need to focus on. So in this time around, we're going to have a separate legal entity for the first time. A corporation in its own right is a separate legal person. It's going to be um, board and management so executive means the management the executive team so it's going to be board of directors plus management operating the thing operated and on top of this uh in terms of the owner liability here uh the owners, the shareholders, have absolutely limited liability. That's why they're called limited companies. There, there doesn't have to be somebody who takes full responsibility, so unlimited, like with general partner. No, limited liability. The flip side is this idea of... Um, uh, you know, uh, over here, uh, corporate income tax. I've been being paid. And then the consequence of that is double taxation when owners receive their dividend payments. Although there are ways to relieve this, there may be tax credits, but they're very jurisdiction specific. And the big plus here is these kinds of entities enjoy unlimited access to capital. You know, they can attract as many owners, as many shareholders as they want who provide equity funding. Um, your curriculum talks, you know, in this in this reading or in this learning module a little bit about the difference between equity and debt, but I don't think this is something we really need to go to, into. That's so basic. Equity is non return I'm just going to summarize. I'm not even going to write this down. Equity is um, the funding you get from your shareholders. It's non-returnable. And it doesn't have to come necessarily from direct injections by, um, by shareholders. Equity can also, in a business, be the earnings generated by the company that have been kept by the business instead of being paid out as a dividend. So when you pay a dividend to shareholders, that dividend must come out of profit, but anything that's kept by the business makes equity grow. Obviously, corporations 
typically also have access to the debt market, so they may issue bonds, um, which obviously constitute um, returnable funding. Um, bond investors are compensated with interest and coupons, which you should know about from your studies of fixed income. And this is all at the um, this is all available to especially to corporations, limited uh, companies, corporations. Right. As a final point in this lesson, I want to show you an example of a question that's inspired by an example in your curriculum of this double taxation and what could possibly be asked. It's going to be very simple, but still, I want you to be ready for it. So let's check out a really basic curriculum inspired question on the concept of double taxation, a numerical question. Uh, the total tax rate experienced by investors in a profitable public limited company, which pays corporate income tax at a rate of 20%, has a policy of maintaining a dividend payout ratio of 100%, main, uh, meaning that all the profits the company generates are paid out as a dividend to investors and nothing is kept. And also uh, that a company operates in a jurisdiction where uh, dividends received are taxed at 30%. And what is that total tax rate closest to? Well, the total tax rate is what is effectively felt by investors once you take into account everything, all the deductions that they suffer due to corporate income tax, but also the, um, the personal income tax that they get levied on their dividend payouts. So, I mean, you could is using percentages only but you could for example imagine that a company has let's say um, taxable income so income that is subject to taxation of um, 100 million thousand billion whatever and obviously the first deduction that we're going to make is one for um, corporate income tax so from that minus uh, corporate income tax. Now in the exam, don't write this out like this. Use shorthand, uh, use, you know, do this in, in your head, how, however you wish. So that's going to be 20% of the taxable income. So um, effectively the net profit uh, of the business the one that can be distributed as a dividend or kept in the company is just 60. Now, in our case, <laughs> retained earnings are not going to be a thing because this company doesn't retain its earnings. It pays things out as a dividend. Um, right, it's, it's not the most usual of policies, but never, never mind. Okay, as a dividend to shareholders. But, sorry, over here I've made a very, very huge mistake. This shouldn't say 60, it should say 80. 100 minus 20 is 80. Sorry for that. Probably left you confused and staring at your screens for a moment. So 80 dividend to shareholders. And now, um, you know, that 80 um, is subject to tax at the personal level. And that's taxed at 30%. Uh, so tax on dividends. It's going to be 30% of this. Um, if you do 80 um, times 30%, I mean, I've got my calculator out, but I think it's going to be 24 because that's uh, 8 times 3 is 24. 80 times 0 0.3, yeah, 24. But, you know, given the blunder I made here, I don't want to <laughs> risk it anymore. Uh, that was embarrassing enough. So, um, yeah, that's going to be a 24 deducted. So ultimately, what the shareholders receive is 80 minus 24. Let's get this one right. 56 um, cash flow to the shareholders. And when they ask you about the total tax rate as they do in this question what they're effectively thinking about is going for is you know what's the total deduction 
that goes from over here down to here and well, it's 44%, right? It's 44 of 100 that gets deducted, uh, meaning 44%. Um, uh, so total tax rate is these two deductions combined, I guess, the 20 and the 24. 20 plus 24 on original income of 100. So uh, 44 over 100, 44%. Yeah, and this is nicely in line with answer A. And you may think to yourself, you know, there surely is an easier way of solving this. Yeah, there is. Um, you know, whatever is the taxable income, doesn't really matter. Uh, I imagined it to be a nice round 100, but you could just as well have solved this by doing, taking one minus, and now in a bracket, although I don't really need the bracket, to be honest, arithmetically or algebraically, I'm going to take um, the, um, whatever is uh, one minus 0 0.2 multiplied by one minus 0 0.4 sorry this is a three although it doesn't really look like a three so let's let's write this down properly one minus 0 0.8 times 0 0.7 which is basically what's left after you deduct tax of 20 percent and tax of 30 percent over here and this should work properly um 0 0.8 times 0 0.7 on my calculator is 0 0.56 and obviously that's nice and in line with what we've got left after those two taxes are applied. Uh, make that negative, plus one, okay, 0.44%. Now this, this is not something supplied in your curriculum, but I find this to be a much more intuitive way of thinking about it, or maybe much quicker than going and doing all these steps. There isn't a huge chance you'll get a question on this, but uh, you never know. So now you know the concept.